Good morning everyone and welcome to our midweek reflection. Um, we are still in this period of national mourning for uh, our late Sovereign Lady Queen Elizabeth. So uh, a prayer to reflect that and a prayer for the King. God of love, we thank you for the life of the Queen, for her service to our nation and for her faith in you. Be close to all of us who mourn that we may find comfort and hope in your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. An everlasting God, we pray for our new King, Charles III. Bless his reign and the life of our nation. Help us to work together so that truth and justice, harmony and fairness flourish among us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 7 and it's from verse 36 to the end. It's on page 85 in the standard Good News Bible if you wish to uh, follow it. Page 85 in the New Testament. The Gospel according to Luke chapter 7 beginning at verse 36. Jesus at the home of Simon the Pharisee. Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. A Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him, and Jesus went to his house and sat down to eat. In that town was a woman who lived a sinful life. She heard that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, so she brought an alabaster jar full of perfume and stood behind Jesus by his feet, crying and wetting his feet with her tears. Then she dried his feet with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, If this man really were a prophet, he would know who this woman is who is touching him. He would know what kind of sinful life she lives. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Yes, teacher, he said, tell me. There were two men who owed money to a moneylender, Jesus began. One owed him 500 silver coins, and the other owed him 50. Neither of them could pay him back, so he cancelled the debts of both. Which one, then, will love him more? I suppose, answered Simon, that it would be the one who was forgiven more. You are right, said Jesus. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your home, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed her feet with her with her tears and dried them with her hair you did not welcome me with a kiss but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came you provided no olive oil for my head but she has covered my feet with perfume I tell you then the great love she has shown proves that her many sins have been forgiven but whoever has been forgiven little shows only a little love then Jesus said to the woman your sins are forgiven the others sitting at table began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? But Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The assumption is that this unnamed woman in the Gospel according to Luke is Mary Magdalene. And that's mainly because um, straight after chapter 7, beginning of chapter 8, it says, Sometime later Jesus travelled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the Kingdom of God, the twelve disciples went with him, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out, Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many other women who used their resources, their own resources, to help Jesus and his disciples. So, by virtue of the fact that comment is there, um, people have always assumed that this was Mary Magdalene who was doing the anointing. 
and most of the Jesus films and uh, musicals have Mary Magdalene um, at this point. Jesus Christ Superstar famously had the song I Don't Know How to Love Him while Mary Magdalene was anointing Jesus' feet. But, um, those of you that like detective stories, in the Gospel according to John, there is um, another story of an anointing. It's obviously not the same moment. Uh, it's in the week before Jesus was crucified. But the person doing the anointing is Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who uh, it, she's actually named as the person doing the anointing. And of course she is very grateful that Jesus has um, raised her brother to life and is showing her respect. So it's the same place, it's Bethany, and possibly obviously a different house because it's Lazarus's house, her house, and um, it's not in the, in the house of Simon the Pharisee. But I am not the first person to have asked the question, are these two Marys actually one and the same person? Um, the question was asked and answered, in my opinion, very um, satisfactorily by a scholar called John Wenham um, in a book called Easter Enigma that many of us uh, studied a little while ago. But just very, very briefly, because it's relevant to the story, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the sister of Lazarus, are never mentioned together. There is no gospel story or passage where they appear at the same time. And I think that's significant because we, we hear of um, Mary Magdalene being at the crucifixion, but I would be completely surprised if Mary, the sister of Lazarus, wasn't at the crucifixion. Now, of course, if they're the same person, that solves the problem. Now, there is a way of, of reconciling the two. Um, first of all, if you think of the story of when Jesus visited Martha and Mary, which is related in Luke, he gets to their house in Bethany. Martha's doing all the washing up and all the cooking and all the faffing about in the background. Mary is sitting and listening to Jesus. Martha gets upset, has a go at Jesus. Look, my sister is, you know, sitting here doing nothing. I'm doing all the work. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are troubled and worried about too many silly things. Don't worry. Your sister has chosen the right thing. Now, why, we ask ourselves, would Mary just be sitting listening to Jesus? Is it because she needed reassurance, forgiveness? Um, why was she dead keen? Now, of course, the other problem is, this is in Bethany, which um, is just east of Jerusalem. It's about a mile and a half um, east of Jerusalem on... Um, uh, just beyond the Mount of Olives. Now, um, Mary Magdalene is obviously got the name Magdalene because of the town of Magdala, which is actually um, in Galilee, and it's on the west coast of Lake Galilee, quite near Tiberias, which was the... Um, the sort of capital city, if you like, of Galilee. Although, interestingly, although Lake Galilee is called Lake Tiberius on one occasion, the, the, the town, the city is not mentioned in the gospel. But anyway, um, Magdalene said. Now, Magdala had a reputation for uh, prostitutes and generally people of ill repute. So the speculation is that um, Mary from Bethany, a bit like the younger brother in the parable of the prodigal son, which is another significant factor because when it talks about Martha and Mary, it's always Martha first and then Mary, which 
implies that Martha was older than Mary because that's the way um, Jewish society works. It's like James and John, the sons of Zebedee, you assume that James is the older because he's always mentioned first. So, and don't forget the parable of the, good, uh, of the prodigal son is actually in the Gospel according to Luke. So let's speculate that Mary is fed up with her life in Bethany with Martha and Lazarus and she leaves home and goes to uh, Galilee, the north. It's a much more relaxed place. It's a much more, um, it's still Jewish. It, it's not Samaria, which is in the middle, which is different. It's definitely a Jewish area. But it's not like Jerusalem, it's not like the south where everyone's a bit particular and the temple's there and they're all obeying the rules. Um, Galilee's more relaxed. I mean, in our modern world, you know, the number of people you meet who say, yes, I'm a Christian, but I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Uh, you'd, you'd meet people in Galilee saying, well, I'm a Jew, of course I'm a Jew, I'm a practicing Jew, but I don't go often to the synagogue. And I certainly don't go down to the temple unless I absolutely have to three times a year. So it's much more relaxed. Anyway, Magda, Magdala has this reputation. Let's assume Mary goes there, uh, earns her living as a prostitute, you know, enjoys a bit of reckless living. And then Jesus appears. He goes all around Galilee um, preaching. And at some point, maybe, he comes to this uh, home of a Pharisee and Mary has heard about him and she thinks I've got to change I've really got to change so she goes and she anoints him and she realizes that she's been forgiven and she helps Jesus and his disciples and logically she would have drifted home to Bethany so when Jesus comes to visit Mary is the one who's been forgiven and restored and sits at Jesus' feet, lapping up every word. And Martha, a bit like the elder son in the prodigal son story, is grumpy. Look, I'm doing all the work. I've been here. I haven't gone away. I haven't done anything nasty. I'm getting on with the job. And my sister is not helping me out. Jesus' reaction. Don't worry. Listen to me. While you've got me, listen to me. So, you know, your choice. Look up the references. It, it's, it's a fun thing to do and just to speculate about um, Mary being the same person. What does she do at this particular moment? Um, she expresses her gratitude and her love to Jesus because she has been forgiven. She knows that Jesus has forgiven her sins and the one who has been, give, been forgiven more in the story is the one who loves more and gives much more back and Mary is in that position. So it makes sense if it's the same woman when Jesus is staying in Bethany in the week that we now call Holy Week before the crucifixion that she uh, restates her position if you like like she had done maybe a couple of years before um, in the early chapters of Luke she's doing it again and uh, making the point that this is the only thing she knows how to do how can she show her gratitude how can she show her love she's a woman in a man's world uh, she can't do anything physical except get the most expensive thing that she has and give it to Jesus and anoint him and say thank you very much and then of course as we know if it is the same person she was present at the crucifixion and the very first person to see Jesus risen from the dead on Easter day. And Jesus sends Mary to tell his brothers and his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And the word, um, the verb is apostolo, to send. So Mary is often called the apostle to the apostles. She was the one who was sent, first of all, um, to tell them about uh, the good news. So it's a remarkable story and in uh, the Gospel according to John uh, Judas moans about 
Mary anointing Jesus because he says the money could have been given to the poor. And there's little in brackets bits that apparently Judas was the treasurer who carried the bag and used to help himself from it. So he wasn't interested in um, the giving the money to the poor, he was just interested in the money and annoyed that this woman was wasting money on Jesus when maybe he could have helped himself to it. Jesus' response is, you will always have poor people with you, but you won't always have me. So while I'm here, make the most of me and listen to me. And that is, is sort of spelt out in what Mary does and Mary listening to him. And of course, Jesus gives his life on the cross for the sins of the whole world so that we can all be forgiven. And he was anticipating that when he was forgiving Mary. And Jesus has the right to do it. Uh, people whinged about it, but no, Jesus has the right to forgive because of who he is and of what he will do on the cross and rising from the dead on the very first Easter day. So let us be glad that we know of what Jesus has done for us. And let's pray that we will be able to respond to Jesus in the same way. I mean, we're not Mary. We, we haven't got perfume and we haven't got Jesus physically here to do anything like that to him. But there are all sorts of ways in which we can honour Jesus because of what he's done for us. And... I mean, there are, in a sense, there are huge parallels with the Queen at the moment. People are being interviewed in the queue, you know, why are you here? Oh, because of what she's done for the country, or because of what she's done for me as an individual, or because of what she's done for the good of uh, all the people and the nation and the Commonwealth. And people said, we just want to give something back. We want to pay our respects. We want to stand there for a moment. We want to lay flowers. We want to do something. Well, the remarkable thing with Jesus is that it's not a dead hero that we are uh, acknowledging like we are with the Queen. Jesus is living and we can still acknowledge him and all that he's done for us in everything that we do. And the best thing we can do is give of ourselves. Lord, here is my life. Send me. Do with me whatever you wish. We can do the physical stuff as well. We can, we can put money in the plate we can put flowers in the church, we can um, do all sorts of things contributing to the life of the church in our gratitude for what Jesus has done. But the best thing we can do between ourselves and him is to say, here is my life dedicated to you. I give my life to you um, so that we can go all go in the right direction. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and we're going to sing, I just need a bit of a moment to get it together, we're going to sing God forgave my sin in Jesus name. Freely, freely you have received, freely, freely give. So I'm just going to uh, pause the recording. God forgave my sin in Jesus name. I've been born again. In Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said, freely, freely, you have received. Jesus' name, in earth and heaven, in Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his power as he told me to. He said, freely, freely, you have received.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.